Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. This is the first episode of 2021. Hello and healthy, happy and healthy 2021 to all of our Merrick patrons and our viewers near and far. Welcome to the fourth episode of Top Shelf Live at Merrick Library. I am your host, Librarian Carol Ann Tack. I hope you're all staying safe and you're staying healthy. I can't thank you all enough for coming here and I thank you all so much for watching. There's a lot of things you could be watching on TV, on your computers right now, and you're here with us and I am very grateful. I also wanna just take a quick moment to send out a very special thanks to our first guests, authors James Wade, and Kim A.H. Kim and Kathleen Rooney. They joined me the past three months and I appreciate all of them so much for letting me monopolize their time. Just so you guys know, you can find those interviews on the Merrick Library YouTube channel. That channel is Merrick Library NY. The interviews are great. So if you miss them, please check them out. If you're looking for something different to watch, you can watch those. But aside from all of that, Tonight, I am thrilled. My very special guest, I'm hosting, as you can see, the wonderful author, Betsy Carter. Now, a lot of you know her from her first novel, which was amazing, the Orange Blossom Special. She had a national best-selling memoir, Nothing to Fall Back On, which is really just terrific. I can't talk about that one enough, enough. And this book, which came out in 2017, 2018, We Were Strangers Once. This book is amazing. I always say that it's really true. But before I get to any of this, I do want to say that Betsy Carter is here. Uh, she formerly served as an editor at Esquire and a writer reporter at Newsweek and Harper's Bazaar and was also the founding editor of New York Woman. Now, I can tell you, I did not do any of that today, this week, or this morning. So we are sitting here with some with some significant royalty here. <laughs> um, in 2018, Betsy Carter joined me at the Merrick Library to discuss her book, We Were Strangers Once, which is right here. And at her visit, there was so much positive feedback and love for this book. We had close to 50 people who came to the library to listen to Betsy Carter talk about her book. And we had an incredible book discussion. So viewers, please, if you would, give a big virtual applause to author Betsy Carter. Betsy, thank you so much for being here. I am so happy to see you again. <laughs> well, I'm so happy to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I am talking about that discussion because one of the weird things that happened at that event was our um, microphone stopped working and we had such a huge crowd. And I remember you put the microphone down and you walked right into this crowd and you just started addressing the, it was amazing. And I think everyone just fell in love with you at that moment, which was just microphone terrific. So, um, oop, I'm sorry. That's my, that's my, okay. Um, that was, you know, technical glitches folks. It's live TV. Um, it happens. So it was an amazing moment. You walked right into the crowd and everyone fell in love. But now let's flash forward two years later and you have given us Lost Souls at the Neptune Inn. Would you please, I'm going to not do this book justice. This book is, please, would you just tell the viewers what this book is about? Well, it's about, it's about people in the broad sense, it's about people who want to find a home and want to be loved and what they will do in order to find that home and in order to find love. And that is a very broad stroke. And then it's broken down into a family of women, three women, who uh, they own a bakery in um, New Rochelle, New York, which is somewhere in Westchester. Uh, they have kind of a hard life but a, and they have strife with when it, within each other the mother and the daughter don't get along uh the daughter has a child out of wedlock a little girl named alice um who brings joy into the family and they they're sputtering along until one day a stranger named dillard fox wanders, wanders into town and i know that's a cliche a stranger came to town and boom everything happens but in fact a stranger comes to town dillard 
And we learn about Dillard and we learn about his relationship with each of these women. And um, without, going, without giving too much away in, um, in a strange way, he fulfills everything that these women are missing. Little Alice is missing a father and he fulfills that role as a father. Geraldine, the mother who was very beautiful in her heyday and still thinks she is very beautiful. Uh, she fulfills the fantasy that he's flirting with her and likes her. And the daughter, <laughs> Geraldine, who's uh, actually falls in love with Dillard. And so he fulfills that role. And so he is a, a kind of the pivot around which the story revolves. I love that it's a new Rochelle. I don't know anything about new Rochelle, but I do know now. <laughs> and I love that, you know, it, it comes across as a small town. I don't think of new Rochelle typically as a small town, but I'd never been there. So in my mind, I just sort of pictured this sort of bucolic Cape Cod houses on the Long Island Sound, just as you describe it. And, um, but it just has this very small town feel. And I, that's what I think makes it so appealing to me and to our readers. I love, there's a wonderful quote from author, I, I'm, going, I'm not sure if I'm gonna say her name right. Uh, she did a review of the, in the Los Angeles Review of Books. I think her name is Lorraine Despress. And so. she did a, this review. She says that Lost Souls is a lyrical old to love. With liquid prose, Betsy Carter takes us on an exploration of love through much of the 20th century, from the excitement and passion of the new to the comfort and family and all its complexities. That is true. And that's a mic drop for this book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And I'm actually looking at some of the comments here. Janet Schneider is saying, hello. I see Melissa's out there and Lori. There's a bunch of Merrick Library people. and from other places. Janet, hello. This is your copy, actually, the copy she <laughs> lent to me. And I'm actually going to give Janet a shout out because right around Thanksgiving, I had started reading this book. There's so many things going on in the world and I was starting to lose my focus again for reading. It happened in March of 2020. And I, so here it is Thanksgiving break and I've got a bunch of galleys in front of me, a bunch of books, and there's one of the things I do is if I can't focus, I line up all the books and I start reading the first chapter or two just to see if anything is going to grab me because through no fault of the book, it's just what's going on in my head at the time. And that's what I did. And then when I began the first chapter of this book, two and a half hours go by. My family doesn't know where I am. I'm curled up in the corner of the house reading this book. And I thought, well, thank you, Janet Schneider. And when I texted her, she said, well, don't thank me. Thank Betsy Carter, who, said, who wrote the book. It was absorbing. The prose is just beautiful. It's an excellent book discussion book. There's so much to talk about here. Can you tell viewers what your inspiration was for this book? Yeah, so I suppose I can. Um, I wanted to write, two things happened. Uh, okay, if you read my memoir, which I don't expect everybody has, I went through a really, really tough seven years. And uh, like I have sperm down, I got breast cancer, my mother died, I was in a car accident. I mean, really terrible stuff. And I was seeing a therapist at the time and I went into her one day and I said, you're not gonna believe this, but my house burned down, I lost everything. And she looked at me and she said, um, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the fact that you might've been a very bad person in a past life. And I want you to think about getting an exorcism. And it, I mean, it was shocking. It was really shocking. And I, I said, I'm gonna just pretend you didn't say that and we're just gonna go on. And of course I never went back, but Obviously that has stayed with me all of my life. It has happened years ago. So I think when I started, I wanted to write about a person who might have had the devil in her and might have wanted to have an exorcism. So my, oh my character, um, Amelia May, is the daughter of the woman I was talking about. Her name is Geraldine. And when Amelia May is uh, a baby, she uh, has colic and one day um, Geraldine, who's Catholic, goes to her crib and she sees that Gerald, that the baby's tongue is black and she is convinced that this child has the devil in her. And 
that makes for a contentious relationship pretty much for the rest of their life. So there was that. Um, uh, I, I guess that was the biggest, that was the biggest thing. And I wanted a character like Dillard, uh, which we can get into a little bit later. I was married before this marriage and Dillard uh, is not my ex-husband, but looks exactly like him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I was curious to write about forgiveness and different kinds of love and what happens in life as you do you forgive do you love how do you love how different people love each other despite what's gone before so i guess those were the two things um i'm still trying to get past the therapist saying you needed an exorcism <laughs> I, you know i don't know you know that's like if back then they i don't know if they had yelp reviews but boy that would have been something to oh, write I about in the middle of new york city and i thought i've got to, i did think i should find an exorcist i did think i was probably needed one but i couldn't yeah and it. how far is saint pat's from where you were at the it's time not far. <laughs> Are you gonna just knock on the door? I'm here. <laughs> um, that's um, that's an incredible story. I so we get the inspiration. The family members in the book. So it is this three generations of women, right? It's uh, Geraldine, and then Amelia May, and then Alice. Each of them, you do this deep dive into each of the characters and i'm wondering especially with somebody like geraldine who really kind of isn't you know she kind of gets forced into this motherhood thing at an before she's really ready for it um when you go out on your book tours although i i understand that 2020 was horrible for book tours and you did some zoom events and you can talk to that at some point, how that was to do everything via Zoom. Were the readers talking to you about specific characters? Were they like angry at Geraldine or did they love Dillard? Or what were readers saying about the characters that were memorable moments that you could re recall? I think the thing that was m most memorable that people said is that between those characters and there are other characters in the book, everybody seems to identify with one or the other. And I think that's what got to me the most was like, oh my God, Geraldine, I've known, I just got an email yesterday from someone who read the book and said, you must have known the same mothers growing up that I did, <laughs> and, you know, and, um, or people like, a lot of people identify with Dillard. It just depends who you are and what your circumstances, but that they, people seem to pick out one character or a lesser character, less, you know, major character that they identified with. And I, I like that. I think that's, that's terrific. Yeah, it's great because I think if the time period is the 1950s, and even though we're talking about this these this generational story, everyone in the 1950s had a very specific gender role to play, whether they wanted it or not, in New Rochelle. And even though 1950s seems so far away, it's <laughs> some there are other days where it just doesn't seem that far away. Right. So I think I'm sympathetic to Geraldine. And I won't tell anybody why, because you'll just have to, here it is again, read it again. Um, I think, I would be curious to see what the thoughts are. Um, and we'll probably have a book discussion for this book at some point at Merrick Library, because there's too much going on in a good way. There's so much going on. I do want to talk about, um, so yes, I'm I'm sympathetic to Geraldine. I adore Dillard. And even though Geraldine makes choices that uh, people would say, Carolyn, what is wrong with you, right? But I do feel for her. I do feel like she's, you know, she's going through something. So anyway, uh, talk about New Rochelle. Why said it, what drew you to New Rochelle? That's a good question. Um, I actually had never been to New Rochelle. Um, I wanted to be near New York. Uh, but I didn't want to be in New York City for exactly the reasons you mentioned earlier. I wanted to have a small enough town that these people could all intermingle and know each other. Um, but I didn't want it to be way far away. So I, my, my agent is from New Rochelle. So oh. I had her, we, we did a lot of travels to New Rochelle and I got to know it in the streets. The town is actually a very mixed town. It's, uh, it's got some very poor people and it. it's got some very rich people in it. Um, it's it's not one religion. It's it's racially mixed. It always has been, and I like that aspect of it too because these people are you know these are not 
wealthy people, but they know wealthy people. And I just wanted everybody a little bit close by. Um, I grew up in Miami um, and I didn't, I've, I've done some, a lot of books in Florida. Um, this seemed like the people in New Rochelle who I imagined in the fifties were people I probably knew growing up in Miami. So I could very much slot them in there um, with, without the Miami twist, without the suntans, without the, but you know, I, I knew them, I knew them. <laughs> yeah, and I think some of them, like especially, they're familiar to me as well. And I'm not, I'm focusing on Geraldine just because she reminded me of a lot of women that I remember my, my friends' moms or growing up in Brooklyn, going to somebody's house and then, you know, the mom is in the kitchen or whatever. So I kind of really related to her because I felt like I knew her and I'm not related in the way that I, I was, that I knew what she was going through, but related in the way that I, I, could picture her at the kitchen sink. I could picture her um, vacuuming. I could picture her working. Like there were just things about her that seemed very real to me. And I love that you chose New Rochelle. It would be like also the time period, the way you describe the street corners and, and all of that, it's it's really, um, I don't know how you do it, Betsy, honestly, I, I don't, that's why you're the writer and I'm the fan. So <laughs> we'll leave that there. Um, I also think about New Rochelle as a town because it reminds me a little bit of, I was thinking of Bay Ridge when I was growing up as a younger person. So um, I get just get the whole book all together. I do wanna ask you about this cover because this cover is beautiful. And I noticed that it is done, the jacket design is by Joanna O'Neill and she did a wonderful job. As an author, do you get to pick or, or sort of look at some of these covers and decide which one you want and were there other ones that sort of didn't quite make it? This was this was pretty much, I mean, this design was, I mean, usually you get, you go through a, a number of designs. This one just hit right away. And um, uh, there were tweaks now and then or colors that were enhanced or something, but she really, this one just hit it right out the park right away. It, it's- yeah. uh, very reminiscent of an Edward Hopper painting, I think, and it captures the small town and it captures somewhat of an isolation. I mean, they did put a person in there, but it does have that feeling of people sort of being on their own and feeling isolated, which I think is also quite wonderful. So yeah, yeah. well, it and that's, I noticed that I, I was, as we were talking earlier, uh, before we went live, one of the things I didn't, a couple of things I didn't realize is I read the whole book and then I went back and looked at the cover art and I noticed the young woman. And of course, all I kept thinking of was Amelia May. And one of the other things I thought about was loneliness is that, you know, every person has stuff that they don't share with other people. They hide from other people. Mm -hmm. And that's really comes out in this book. That's a lot of the crux of the different stories that, that, that the characters have. Um, was there one character as you were writing, like when you started doing, I'll start again with Geraldine, when you're writing Geraldine, does she sort of come to you right away? Like who, which character came first? Did you think of Amelia May first or how did the story, like what, when did the character start speaking to you? Well, they don't, Amelia May, I guess was first, partly because the exorcism thing, Geraldine, <laughs> I was very curious. I'm, I've always been curious about women. I, I knew a lot of these moms growing up who were just beautiful. And you knew that they were beautiful when they were younger and that they were still beautiful. And I always sensed that sometimes there was a bit of resentment for their daughters. And I wanted to explore that with Geraldine. So I think when I do a character, I always have what, what brings me to a character is some exploration, you know, I wanted to understand who Geraldine really was. And I think, as you said, all of these characters have secrets uh, that they have kept from other people. And I wanted to get at their secrets and I wanted to understand why they had their secrets. Um, Millie May is just kind of, she was interesting to me because she was so doomed from the beginning with her, the devil and all that. And I, I was curious how she was gonna get out of it. Um, what I don't know when I begin, and I, I'm starting something right now, I don't know, I know who these people are a little bit, but as I write, it becomes clearer to me who they're going to be. And one thing I should say that I was a reporter for many years. Um, I wrote for many magazines. I was a reporter for Newsweek. And I, I think I approach my characters like a reporter. I mean, I, 
I try not to talk out loud, but I interview them. So I say, you know, I say to Amelia May, all right, Dillard just said this to you. What are you going to say or what are you going to do? And I kind of watch, you know, I kind of, I, I, I don't know, it sounds like I'm psychotic. I'm really not. But I kind of, um, in that way is how I develop them. I ask them questions. I move them forward. And uh, who they become happens as I'm writing it. Um, Dillard was a character that I wanted to explore. I will say this, that Dillard is gay, which comes up pretty, I would say pretty early in the book. Uh, I wanted to understand him and I wanted to understand, he falls in love with a man and I wanted to understand what that love is like, which is obviously not that much different from any other kind of love. Um, but I wanted to understand Dillard. I wanted to understand his life and his choices and especially his choices in a time when it wasn't easy to make his choices. So I think with each one of them, I started out with um, a question and I started out with wanting to discover something about them and in the writing, that's how, writing is how I come to understand things. It's the best way I come to understand things. Do you find that coming from this sort of nonfiction um, reporting style, that helps when you edit. So I don't know how many you know edits. I know a lot of times the book goes to an editor and the editor makes adjustments. But did you do you find that that help? It's very streamlined. There's no fat in this book. Uh, there's no fat in this novel. I feel like it's very um, trim and quick, and it's the narrative just zooms along. Do you find that that experience, that background in writing? has helped you as a writer through the years. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. And one of the things I do, I'm gonna say two things. One of the things I do is I read everything out loud because you can hear it. You can hear when there are two extra words or you can hear it when you just, uh, the wrong word, or you can hear when the rhythm is off. So I do that, but I also had a brilliant editor um, uh, at Hachette who really helped me very, very much. And you know, you can't, I don't think anybody anybody can write a book by themselves. I think you always, right. um, I have, my husband is an editor, so he's my first read and I, my, one of my best friends is a writer and we exchange our books and our writing and um, they always help me too. Um, so yeah, I mean, yes, I do edit myself a lot. Um, when I write, like if I was writing today, tomorrow, I'll open my computer and the first thing I'll do is edit what I wrote today. And of course, I think uh, I sometimes just look at it and think, oh my God, who wrote this? This is terrible, <laughs> you know, and just throw the whole thing out. But yes, you need to have that distance, um, but you do need other people to help you too. That's a great tip. I, I mean, I think that's, so you will write the night before and you're sort of caught up in this now your own narrative flow at that point and then you wake up you go to sleep you sleep on it, and then you wake up the next morning I think that's such a funny image and you're like who the heck was at my computer <laughs> this isn't like you know this go ahead and, uh, sometimes in the, I keep notebooks all over the house you can't see but they're here um and I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and I'll go and I'll write something down and then I think the next morning there was a crazy person <laughs> at my desk <laughs> who wrote that what is that so, so yeah I do that it's like the shoemaker's elves, right? He goes yeah. to sleep and then there's all these shoes. But in this case, we don't exactly know. And I'm curious when your husband looks at the edits, has he ever found himself uh, sleeping on the sofa because of them? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's a, that's a problematic thing. First of all, I'm not allowed to watch him read it, which I oh. do anyway. I figured out a way to watch him through a mirror, but he doesn't know that. Um, <laughs> oh, I hope he doesn't watch this. Um, I hope not too. Anyway, I, he also has been known to like just take a pencil and cross out a oh, paragraph oh. and write no. So I've told him he can't really, he has to go a little softer than that. But yeah. uh, but yes, he's uh, he's tough and he's really good. And um, mostly I listen, not always, but mostly I listen. Right. Okay. So I don't see him on the sofa in the back there. So I guess whatever you're writing right now, you haven't, so you haven't <laughs> shared with it. You know, I haven't shared with anybody yet. Yeah, like what um how, typically so you know we were crazy bonkers for we were strangers once and i can't wait for readers to now read lost souls of the neptune in typically because you've been writing for a while is there a time frame that you have is it from sort of 
does it take two years, three years? I know each book is very different because they're they're almost people unto themselves. But is there sort of a time frame that you give yourself for when you need? I mean, I know the publishers has have a lot of effect on that. But is there a time frame that you write within, say, okay, I've just finished Lost Souls, but I'm already thinking about the next book? You know, each book is different. Lost Souls took me, because it's a historical novel, I did so much research. And not for Lost Souls, I'm sorry, for um, We Were Strangers once. I did so much research. I went to Berlin. I did a lot for that book. So that was six years. This one, I didn't have to go anywhere. Um, uh, Lost Souls, I... I, had, I right. didn't have to do that much research. So that was a much shorter process, two years. Um, so it, it depends. It depends, you know, how much um, I, I did. a I did a book called Swim to Me about mermaids in Florida. Had to Great. do some research for that. Had to go to mermaid camp and everything. So it depends, <laughs> you know. Yes. Um, one of the things about uh, We Were Strangers Once, and it's a, also an excellent book discussion book, is how much historical material is in this book the letters that they write and who they who they send them to and and it's really um so much as we discussed in that book discussion way back when in 2018 if we only knew then what we know now but there was so much i remember a, a lot of the readers in the room saying how much they didn't realize about those letters that were written on behalf of the people oh, yeah uh, and yeah, it was really shocking. I had no idea, well, shocking in the sense that I just didn't know. I don't remember reading it in the newspapers. I don't remember learning about it in school. Um, so I think from that perspective, not only the relationships, which are so beautiful, really, really beautiful, and that ending, but um, excellent book discussion material. How much historical, how much stuff did you leave on the cutting room floor for this? Because there's so much in there, it's hard to know what to leave in and what to leave out because it's so important. I mean, the whole topic is just excruciatingly important. You know, there's a real danger um, writing a book like that where, um, especially when you're doing that much research, you don't want someone to say, I, your research shows, you know? And so what you have to do to get, oh. um, what I tried to do in this book, um, is get the nugget of what I wanted. But of course, when you get the nugget, you have a whole context, a broader context that you've had to read about that. I had to read about the whole time period. And obviously I'm not gonna put everything in there, but maybe I got the nugget of what, you know, what kind of tablecloth they used in those days or right. uh, what a particular letter said that I would have had to read many, many letters to find out. So what you try to do is dig out the, the wonderful little kernel of, you know, something perfect or that suits your your novel at the time and leave the rest on the floor. So I left a lot on the floor, but that's yeah, why and I intended. It's, I, I never, I wrote that expression down, your research shows. I've never heard an author say that before. So that's a um, pretty telling because I didn't think your research was showing here. I just couldn't, <laughs> You know, I think this is another one of those books I read in three days and then said, oh, my gosh, let's find Betsy Carter and see if she'll come to Merrick Library. So um, I do think if anyone is looking for a backlist bump and they, they can't, you know, there is the reason I brought my copy is because there are no copies at Merrick Library right now, because all I do is talk about this book, like every guest that I have <laughs> on, I just kind of book talk all the time. But so if you can't get this one, please grab this you have to grab this because it's it's just something else and and your research wasn't showing and I remember after I finished it talking to anybody who would listen to me and people just suffer along listening to me I mean they are just like tired of hearing me did you know this and did you know that and did you no you didn't well why don't you read this book because it, you know, you'll hear so um yeah, I, I I was curious, but last month we had Kathleen Rooney on and she talked about, uh, she wrote uh, this book called Share Me and Major Whittlesey. And it's sort of a similar, it's about the war. And I said to her, how much stuff did you leave on the cutting room floor? And she said, it was hard because you want to just inform everyone about everything. And it's it's really hard to, to pull back. Um, and you were very successful with We Were Strangers once. So uh, I can't, urge readers enough for that what you kind of gave us a little spoiler before what are you working on 
I, if it's bad luck, you don't have to say, well, you know, we don't want to wind up on the sofa with your, with your husband, <laughs> but is fun. there some, yeah, <laughs> is there something you can share about what your next project is? You know, it's, again, I've started with a character. Um, I've had this character in mind for a long time. Oh. So I, I really, I'm not sure how it's going to go. Um, I have okay. a sense of how it's going to go. Um, what I'm doing differently than I have done in any other book is it's fiction and I'm writing it in the first person in this person's voice and her voice will change as the years go by. And so who knows, but I, okay. I, that's what I'm working on. And I, I can't really. I love hearing you say that she's been with you for a long time. I remember um, at a library event elizabeth strout was there and someone said to her you know why did you write olive again and she said well she just wouldn't leave me alone i, I just kept yeah i mean again not to sound psychotic but there are people <laughs> who you just get curious about you know or questions about people or this this person that i'm writing about i don't i don't know her i don't really know anyone like her um i will say this it was um uh, I guess when the whole pandemic started, I, I, like everyone else, I was cleaning out and I, um, I found all these old, old diaries from, you know, my youth and my college years and everything. And I, I had not read them. And I realized that over the course of like those 10, 15 years from, you know, late teens, maybe to your early thirties, I was like nine different people. You know, I, I was somebody, I, I kind of forgot that I had been that person. And I thought, Am I the only person who, you know, changes? So I, I was curious to, uh, I'm curious to get at that as following somebody as they change and they either consciously or so unconsciously change themselves again or decide, well, now I'm 35 and I, I think I need to be really sophisticated and cool or whatever it is. Um, so that's kind of what I'm after with this. And it was inspired by reading all those diaries, which by the way, when I finished reading them, I filled the sink with water, the kitchen sink with water, and I put them all in because I thought no one should ever have to read this. And because I'd written them in ink, the words floated off the page. It was the most amazing thing you've ever seen in the, in the sink. The water became blue and red, and you could see the water, the words floating off the page. And for that, it was worth destroying all of them. I am by ha a, a, a very emotional at that and also devastated that those pages are gone but i if if it brings us to the next book the, the next book by betsy carter then i'm okay with that what an image that's really i mean that's cinematic you need to copyright that right now because someone's going to put that in a movie and i don't want them to not give that give you the credit for that because i had such a visual on that and i'm sitting here getting all emotional thinking about it so we're all in on that that's great news. Um, the book is Lost Souls at the Neptune Inn. And before you go, I would, I ask all of my authors the same question when they come on <laughs> Top Shelf Live at the Merrick Library. I am a big horror genre fan, horror movie fan, et cetera, of science fiction, thriller. Are there any books that scared the heck out of you? that you can, you, and it doesn't have to be a current, a current events excluded. <laughs> Let's keep it to um, non-current events. But so people will say Stephen King or something like that. Is there anything that you can remember reading either as a youth or recently that um, pretty much scared I'm not a hard you? person because I, I get scared so easily. But uh, the most recent book that I read that scared me a lot was called Leave the World Behind. Oh. Um, Jesus, it was a, it's a, one of those dystopian novels that I usually don't like, but I was, I got into this. Um, that was very scary. Um, I read a book two summers ago that still stayed with me, The Orphan Master's Son about North Oh my Korea. gosh, that book, I, didn't it win the, did it win the Pulitzer Prize? It win the Pulitzer, yeah. Oh my gosh, I, no, I, that was, yes, what a great book. Just ter terrifying, terrifying, I still, I, I still dream about it. The other book, well, the submarine scene, right? When he's in the sub. 
Oh, oh my gosh. I mean, oh. you can't catch your breath. It's just like, I'll never get in a submarine. I mean, <laughs> not that I've been invited, but I won't either. No, but I mean, even if it's, you know, <laughs> one of those tours around like an island or you go under and you see the fish, I'm like, no, thank you. I'm never going to do that. But wow, that's real. So yeah, leave the world behind and the orphan master son. And you were going to mention a third before I lost uh, my mind. Go uh, ahead. A little life, a little life. Oh, Hanya Yanagihara. Yeah. I, I found that Terrific. I mean, I found everything about that book horrifying. Um, so I, those are the three that come to mind that I've read in the last, I would say, year or two. That so we have similar reading habits, which <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what your therapist would say about me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Orphan, <laughs> Master, <laughs> Orphan Master's Son, I kept thinking, stop reading this book, stop reading this book, because it was so terrifying and I couldn't put it down, really couldn't. And you just, uh, it's, I mean, he wrote, I, yes, it, it, yes. And, and I, I totally agree. And also when I think of a little life, when you think of uh, the size of that book and it's probably three of these, you know, it's, it's just a monster. It, it, you're just flipping those pages as fast as you can to see what's going to happen to all these characters. In fact, a friend of mine, um, who is a, he works at the Merrick Library. And he said to me something like, oh, I, I think I'm going to start reading A Little Life. And I said, oh my gosh, James, I, I don't know whether to say good for you or I'm really sorry because it's just- I would say I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely, definitely a tough go. Uh, as we begin 2021, are there any upcoming books you're excited to read or have you started reading anything or is there anything that you wanted to, you know, recommend or thinking um, about? I'm just finishing the Obama book, which is just beautifully written and really beautifully written. And that is only volume one. Yes. <laughs> I just today ordered, pre-ordered, uh, there's a biography coming out of Mike, uh, about Mike Nichols that I'm curious to read. Um, but other than that, uh, right now, I mean, the Obama thing has taken, it's a big book, <laughs> but it's, it's a big book. And if you listen to it on audio, uh, a colleague of mine has said, you know, it's, I don't even know how many hours it is to listen to, but it's, he narrates it and it is extraordinary. It is so good really when good. you listen to it on audio, but then when you, you know, <laughs> so I've taken up walking since everything has, you know, since COVID, <laughs> Like if I start reading that, I'll be in Montauk before you know it. <laughs> you will. <laughs> it's long and it is only volume one. That was what we were talking about. Yeah, but it is, um, it is terrific. Okay, well, Betsy Carter, the book is Lost Souls at the Neptune Inn. And if you joined us late, this Betsy Carter book came out in like 2017, 2018. I highly recommend also for book discussions, We Were Strangers Once. Do not miss this one. It's really extraordinary. And this one, Lost Souls at the Neptune Inn, is her latest. And it came out this summer. And it kind of, you know, like any other book launch that comes, anything that launched in 2020, it got lost in the sauce. But I'm here to tell you that you don't, don't miss this one. Find it quick and, and grab it. There is a waiting list at Merrick Library. So use your independent bookseller or just place your hold with me. I'll be at work tomorrow morning. So I look forward to speaking to all of you. Um, Betsy Carter, I can't thank you enough for joining us on Merrick thank Library's Top so Shelf. Thank you so much for having me. I really had a good time. It was great to see you again. I'm so big hugs, big kisses. Viewers, thanks for joining us this evening. It's always a pleasure to bring authors right to your laptop or your phone or however you're watching. And stay tuned because we have some good things coming up for next month. And if you have exhausted all your viewing possibilities, remember you can listen to me on Top Shelf Live at the Merrick Library where I interview all kinds of authors about all of their amazing books. And we've got some fabulous things coming up in 2021. So I hope you will take part in all of that. Thank you so much, Betsy Carter. Again, Lost Souls at the Neptune Inn. Uh, thanks to everybody at Merrick Library and um, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you all next month. Bye, everybody. Bye.